So recently I watched a video about the Great Lakes, those amazing lakes that cover North America, Canada, the USA, really fantastic places. And on that I seen something be mentioned, it was a song by a Canadian singer called Gordon Lightfoot called The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And someone asked me if I would listen to that song but they told me I should watch a documentary on that, first of all, to understand what actually happened to the Edmund Fitzgerald, to learn more about it. I believe it's a boat that, I don't really know what happened. I'm going to find out in this uh, video, but this is called The Story of the Edmund Fitzgerald, a short documentary. So I'll find out about this situation, which I believed happened on one of the lakes. And the next video, I'll listen to the actual song from Gordon Lightfoot as well. I've not heard any of his music, so interested to hear hear it but let's watch this first tell me what you know about this story and what you think about it as well on the 9th of november 1975 the ss edmund fitzgerald left wisconsin and set off across lake superior laden with a cargo of iron ore pellets Hmm. Okay, so it was a journey the cargo superior. freighter had made many times before, but this particular sailing would be different. The Edmund Fitzgerald would never make it to its planned destination of Zug Island near Detroit, and neither would any of the 29 crew members on board. Hmm. Construction of the Edmund Fitzgerald began in 1957, and was completed the following year. The freighter was, at that time, larger than any other on the Great Lakes, measuring as it did 222 metres or 729 feet from bow to stern. This gargantuan vessel was owned by the Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company and was therefore given the name of the company's then president, Edmund Fitzgerald. Is it normal for life insurance companies to own a boat? I don't, I don't really know how that sort of structure would work or... Did they build it as like an investment for their for their fund or whatever it is? Tell me more about that situation as well. That seems quite interesting. Clearly, Mr. Fitzgerald was proud of the ship his company had commissioned, and he wasn't alone. The crew and captains of the vessel demonstrated a similar pride. She was known in her early years for frequently hauling record-breaking amounts of cargo in a season, and for doing so with an impeccable safety record. The Edmund Fitzgerald was a popular sight with tourists and ship spotters too, especially when under the command of Captain Peter Pulser. This particular captain was known for piping music through the ship's tannoy system to inspire the crew, and for heading out on deck with a bullhorn as the ship passed through locks, in order to bellow commentary and fun facts to watching tourists. The haulage of cargo across the Great Lakes of America might seem like a fairly mundane task. Indeed, the Edmund Fitzgerald was often referred to as a workhorse of a ship. Hmm. It's safe to say, though, that among those in close contact with her, she was a much-loved workhorse. In her early years, she was cared for well, and thus by 1975 was nowhere near the end of her expected lifespan. All being well, it was thought that she stood a good chance of lasting well into the 2000s. However, this was not to be. On the 9th of November 1975, the Edmund Fitzgerald set out on a routine voyage from Wisconsin to Zug Island, loaded with a cargo of iron ore pellets. She departed around 2.15pm, at which time the weather forecast was fair. A storm was due in the early hours of the next morning, but the National Weather Service predicted that it would pass by to the south of Lake Superior, and would thus be of no concern to the crew of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Just five hours later, however, the National Weather Service updated their predictions. Far from passing by to the south, the storm would bring gale force winds to the whole of Lake Superior. The captain at the helm of the Edmund Fitzgerald for this journey was 63-year-old Captain Ernest M. McSawley. When McSawley received this worrying forecast, he ordered a change of direction, steering the freighter towards the Canadian shore of the lake where it might be able to find some shelter from waves and wind. By 1am on the 10th of November, the Edmund Fitzgerald was battling its way through a powerful storm, 
Winds blew at more than 50 knots, and waves more than 3 meters or 10 feet high smashed against the sides of the ship. When you hear the weather like that and it's on a lake, it's actually kind of mind blowing. It's, I guess the Lake Superior is like the biggest lake, it's absolutely gargantuan. But when you see a boat that size, you would think surely that wouldn't have any problems just going across a lake. But clearly, the weather conditions can be quite crazy there. Have you ever experienced any of that sort of weather on any of the Great Lakes yourself? Seems kind of wild. And yeah, it's just a beautiful boat. I'm from Glasgow, so we have like a long history of shipbuilding. I used to go see ships being launched when I was younger, uh, but obviously that industry dried up a bit. So when I see that boat, it's a beautiful big boat, man, like especially for that, uh, that time period as well. Doggedly, the Edmund Fitzgerald crawled onwards through the onslaught. Morning came and the storm continued. At around 2.45 p.m. that day, snow was added to the already challenging conditions reducing visibility and forcing the Edmund Fitzgerald to slow to a crawl. At 3.30pm, Captain McSorley radioed another nearby ship, the SS Arthur M. Anderson, which was following the same course as the Edmund Fitzgerald, but about 16 kilometres or 10 miles behind. I have a fence rail down, two vents lost or damaged, and a list, reported Captain McSorley. In this context, List meant that the ship was tilting to one side. Mm. Captain McSorley asked the Arthur M. Anderson to stay close in case of an emergency. Later, around 7.10pm, the first mate on board the Arthur M. Anderson checked in on Captain McSorley. After providing some navigational guidance, he asked, By the way, Fitzgerald, how are you making out with your problems? Stoically, Captain McSorley replied, We are holding our own. That would be the last communication of any kind from the Edmund Fitzgerald. Mm. The crew of the Arthur M. Anderson tried to radio again and again, but could not get through and couldn't spot the ship on radar. They contacted the Coast Guard, first to express concern and then to outright report that the Edmund Fitzgerald was missing. By 9pm, the Arthur M. Anderson had reached a safe harbour in Whitefish Bay between Michigan and Ontario. However, the Coast Guard was soon in touch to ask the ship to turn around and venture back out to look for the Edmund Fitzgerald. The captain's hesitancy in responding gives some indication as to the conditions at the time. Well, he replied to the Coast Guard, I'll go back and take a look, but God, I'm afraid I'm going to take a hell of a beating out there. I'll turn around and give her a whirl, but God, I don't know. Jeez. I'll give it a try. Despite the awful conditions, the Arthur M. Anderson led the search. It was to be an unsuccessful one. The only trace of the Edmund Fitzgerald that was found was a smashed lifeboat and some other debris. After many ships had spent many hours searching the waters in increasingly treacherous conditions, there was only one conclusion that could be reached. The Edmund Fitzgerald had sunk. There were many questions to be answered about this disaster. First and foremost among them was what had actually caused the sinking. There had been no distress signal, and not one of the crew members on board had been able to escape in a lifeboat. Mm, How were other ships true. in the area able to weather the storm when the Edmund Fitzgerald was not? Mm. Was there anything particular about the design of the ship that led to its sinking? Even now, after years of extensive investigation, there are no answers to these questions, Really? only many theories. Ooh, that's the wreckage, discovered five days after the sinking, has been surveyed and visited multiple times. The ship lies broken in two pieces, and some theorise that it fractured under stress while still on the surface. Others believe strongly that this is not possible, and that the ship must have been swamped by a series of massive rogue waves. Mm. Still others contend that the sinking must have been down to the cargo hold flooding, or to the ship scraping against a reef in the dark and confusion of the storm. Perhaps, it was alleged, the ship had not been as well cared for under Captain McSorley as it had in previous years. Some evidence was found that repairs had been deferred or temporarily patched, and the captain had a reputation for pushing the ship hard and accepting 
no delays, even in extreme weather conditions. Mm. Perhaps it was his actions and decisions that caused the Edmund Fitzgerald to be lost. Possibly. While the exact mechanism of the disaster remains unclear, several contributing factors were identified in the years after the wreck, and even though no single one could be blamed for the incident, changes were made to improve safety across the board. In the aftermath of the disaster, depth detectors were made mandatory on ships mm. over a certain weight, as were survival suits for all crew. Navigational and communication infrastructure on the Great Lakes was improved dramatically, as were maps and charts of the area. Finally, the US Coast Guard began a much more rigorous inspection program of all ships sailing on the Great Lakes. These routes are not without danger, but thanks to these changes and more, there hasn't been another incident as deadly as the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald in the area since. Mm. A memorial to the 29 crew members who lost their lives when the Edmund Fitzgerald sank stands near the water at Whitefish Point in Michigan. The ship's bell and anchor have also been retrieved, and are kept in museums, to be preserved in honour of the memory of the deceased. Mm. The sailors who perished were proud and competent individuals. Though we do not necessarily know exactly why they were lost, we can still appreciate the immense risk they took in order to carry out their work. Yeah. Shipping on the Great Lakes continues to this day, an everyday, necessary undertaking which fuels industry and powers a nation. The journeys back and forth across Lake Superior and the other inland bodies of water in the Great Lakes chain may seem unremarkable, simply because they happen every day. The cargo is mundane, the work steady. But, as the Edmund Fitzgerald shows, the crew who undertake this relatively thankless work do so at great personal risk. Yeah, man, great risk. Oh. Okay, that was interesting. I, I really knew nothing of that before watching that previous video on the Great Lakes, so really interesting to learn about it. It's a quite, like, it's a bit of a mystery. That's the thing I think is even more interesting because obviously it's very sad that those people lost their life, those 29 people. The, the changes that were implemented because of that could potentially have saved a lot of life since then and it's really good to see that all those changes that were implemented but the fact that like even now no one knows what happened and if we don't know now are we ever going to know i don't think so so yeah tell me what you think what are the most common theories there were, there was some mentioned there uh, but if you have any idea or any theory yourself what do you, what do you think happened uh, but yeah it was a beautiful ship Really sad to see what happened, but when you just really think about all of those weather conditions that can happen on a lake, again, being from a country like Scotland, which is so small by landmass, and we have lakes, I could say relatively big compared to the landmass of Scotland, but nothing like this. This is just like probably a big size, a big part of the percentage size of Scotland as a country, that one lake. So it's quite crazy. You get those waves and the crazy conditions and stuff, but an interesting story. Tell me what you think happened. Thanks.